please have that nice question. All right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Answer the question, please. Why is it all right for one, but not all right for the other? Because we're not foxes. Hey everyone, so I was recently invited to speak at a local humanist group about veganism and animal rights. My favorite part of the evening was after I did my talk, they fired questions at me for close to two hours. Now as you're watching, if you like what you're seeing, please consider hitting that subscribe button because I'm about to hit 500 subscribers which is a pretty big deal to me and I really appreciate all the support. Now I'm going to break the Q&A into two parts, um, both above and in the video description if you want to check out the other part. If you're short on time, also check out the video description where you can jump straight to the topic that might be of most interest to you. Now if you're curious to see the talk I did before this q and I'll link that as well, uh, above, below, wherever I can. Now bear in mind that this was recorded in a Mexican restaurant, so the audio and video um, isn't ideal, but I think the content more than makes up for this. With that, let's get into it. Therefore, the animal rights philosophy is a philosophy of peace but is a philosophy that extends the demand for peace beyond the boundaries of our own species. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming here tonight and exploring the different ways that as individuals, we can all increase the peace in this world by respecting others' rights through veganism. Thank you. So with that, I know that was a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, I've got um, more material prepared that I'm happy to go through, but what I'd really like to do um, is open it up to the group and any questions that you might have. I, uh, um, I'm used to being challenged, I quite enjoy it, so don't feel like you're gonna put me off. If there's something that I covered that you just kind of sticks with you and you're not quite sure on or you'd like to explore more, or possibly your own experiences, I think there's some interesting intersections between humanism and veganism that perhaps we can explore. So with that, did anybody have any thoughts um, as you were listening to this? Anything that um, it made you think of? What you were yeah. saying about the cow which was having a lovely life and then it would have one bad day. Uh -huh. And you said, no, if you didn't have that bad day, it would live on and have a long life. Uh -huh. But if you were going to eat that cow, maybe it wouldn't have been bred and it wouldn't have had a life in the first place. At least we're giving it yeah. life. Well, and I think there's there's two key things there. I I I, I, uh, I can tell that you um, uh, you contemplate this, and that that's why I'm very careful not to just say that um, animals want to live. I think that's a common chant that um, we'll hear within the animal rights space. But to me, I agree the solution is to not breed them in the first place. And if that's a sticking point with us, if we um, reverse things, and I think it's interesting to take the animal centric perspective. If our purpose was to be bred only to be um, killed, would we want to live that life? That's probably a philosophical question that's perhaps outside of the scope of tonight, but I know the answer for me is I would uh, choose to have that, and is it really a net positive life if our sole purpose is to be raised for usually about three to six months and then to be killed? So I mean, I guess that's a question for all of us. Would we want to be born if we knew you know, the average lifespan for those male chicks? 24 to 48 hours. Would we want to be born if our sole purpose was to be killed in the most, the most ruthless way, even if it was a kind way? I mean, does, does that kind of yeah, address yeah. kind of what you're thinking yeah. of? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I know, I know for me as a vegetarian, um, even when I started um, uh, becoming more aware of these things, I'm like, okay, maybe there's a dark side, but I'm sure they do it in the best way. And so I think that's a, a common, you know, at least they get life. But to me. I mean, if you want to see the other side of it, I encourage everyone to, to check out the Friendly Animal Sanctuary and going to see the animals there because animals aren't going to drop off the face of the planet, you know, if we stop using them. In fact, animal use is the leading cause of species extinction. Around 200 species a day are going extinct, and the vast majority of that is through animal use. Look at the Amazon forest fires. They weren't just having a campfire, they were clearing those forests to raise cattle. And you might say, well, they're also um, clearing it for soy, but the soy was predominantly to feed to the cattle. So that just wipes out all kinds of species. So while I agree, you know, right to life, we're also, you know, it's a, it, when we look at the bigger picture, I think there's, you know, yeah. more than just that. Yeah. yeah. So well, yeah, address, probably addresses your question then. So yeah. you can see once you get me talking, there's no stopping me. So feel free to <laughs> jump in there. Is there, yeah. is, there, is there a wild version of the cow then? I mean, we used to have the all look. Back in prehistory, <laughs> which uh, got eaten out of the extinction. If we stopped eating 
you stop using beef, <coughs> would, would the cows we know it no longer need to exist? I don't see the cow going extinct, personally. I think when we look at the modern day cows, they were, um, they've been genetically modified to grow in a certain way to maximize profitability. I don't. I think if, if if we're honest, we're very early on in the, the history of this as a social movement. Mm. So as you know, um, uh, people like us start to um, reduce the demand, the supply will gradually reduce. But to be honest, I think the the point we just discussed around um, the other species that are impacted, it's much more likely for them to go extinct. I, th I think most of the animals that we um, use here in the UK are from Southeast Asia originally. So it's. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So, but yeah, I, I certainly don't have a strength in um, the the free living cows. So, if anybody else has any, <laughs> were you thinking more from a just a species preservation perspective that we should use them? To no, no, not at all. I, I just, I just had had some thought. I thought, I think I've seen a wild cow. Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting story because especially in the U.S. The cow is the one species that they will track down and find, and they will not allow a single one to escape. Even um, we have around 17 to 18 cows at Friend. They all have to be tagged and regularly TB tested. Um, and it's, it's basically, there's just no escape for them. They're, they're that regulated. So there's certainly no wild cows that I'm aware of. It's actually just because of that situation right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interested in your response to the question. Um, because uh, I, I should say I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. And I'm intrigued by some of the, um, you know, the, the, the philosophies that you're, you're projecting. Um, now, anthropomorphization is something which I think is very important. I think, you know, how, do, how could we learn to relate to anything else if we don't, you know, in some way project ourselves onto it, so I mm. think it's important. But I think there's a limit. Um, you know, you can you know, you can make friends with a dog, a season, a cow, uh, a bird. I've, I've never actually managed a bird, although I gather parrots are incredibly intelligent and, you know, respond very close to people. But I think when you get, um, you know, there's a, there are worms, you know, there are ants, there are, well, actually ants are hugely intelligent, but as individuals, they don't really have the sense of the individual that you're, you're suggesting. So it's getting a bit complicated. But then when we go to the very small, you know, we, we, you know there are uh, creatures that are, um, it's debatable whether they're animals or plants. So where in this hierarchy do you declare that they have animal rights? And where do those rights disappear? I, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think one of my favorite quotes from uh, Tom Reagan, the philosopher I mentioned earlier, says is, you know, if we look at whole list of species, um, you know, whatever order you put them in, wherever you draw that line, he says to draw it in pencil. And that's certainly been my experience, is that, you know, I mentioned earlier, I mean, I was a pescatarian, but pescatarian mostly for 12 years. And the largest reason for that is because I didn't think water animals experienced life in a meaningful way. Or if they did, it was so minute. And I think maybe to help articulate, and then I'll get more back to your, the, 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 the point of that, is I think um, uh, water animals, to me, there's two key things there. Is one, when um, they're being um, hunted in the water and they're being pulled in, they don't just come to the boat. They fight for their life. The other thing I think that is really interesting to think about is if anyone were to come up here and we had a jug of water and they were to hold my head under the jug of water, I'll probably flail around and you might not be able to hear me. And when we pull fish out, they do the same thing. So to me, I think you raised some really interesting questions and I'm just starting to um, look into more of the kind of the, the mollusks and, and you know the different animals. Like you say, where do you draw the line? I think regardless of where we draw the line, I think most of us can agree that cows, pigs, chickens, and the um, animals that are predominantly used um, would fall above that line. I think where we choose to draw that line is, is a, a question that's probably unique to each one of us. But to me, I think it goes back to the, the, the plant versus animal discussion. You know, do they have a brain and do they have a central nervous system? We also talked about intelligence because I think that gets to be an, it's an interesting um, discussion as well. Does intelligence dictate moral value? 
Because if we look at human animals who might have a mental um, disability, do they have less moral value just because they can't experience things in the way that we can? So then why would we attribute them more value? Just because they're human? And that leads into a whole discussion around speciesism, which as both an ideology and a prejudice towards other species, just for the mere fact that they're a different species. So I, can I throw that back on you? Where do you think you would draw the line? Um, if you look, look at the species, who do you think experiences life and might have a, a valid claim to moral rights? Oh, I agree, but it's very difficult. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, we are discovering things about um, uh, aquatic mammals, mm. which uh, 50 years ago were, were not known. Uh, and we are understanding, thank you, David Attenborough, about elephants' complicated lives. And yeah, yeah. It, uh, we, as we understand more, it tends to lower, you know, push the boundaries. Um, so I think my feeling is, is that it's not simple, have they got rights or haven't they got rights? I think it's that the rights are different depending on how much um, uh, how much we relate to them. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I can justify that, but uh, you, yeah. you, know, you, can, you can look at, a, you know, if you've had a relationship with a dog, uh, you know, the idea of meeting a dog is absolutely poor because, you know, you have like, you know, I don't find them. Um, an octopus is an extremely interesting creature because it's, it's hard to imagine having a relationship with an octopus. But um, uh, I don't know if there have been books published in the last few years which I've come across. And it is very striking how um, they have, you know, you know the, like, like your cow, they, they do relate very strongly to people and they have feelings about people and um, they love people. Uh, and, and, and the um, so you asked me where I draw the line. Um, I find it very difficult. So it sounds like octopus. Octo uh, I don't know what the plural of octopus is. Octopi. I was going to guess that. No, thank you. <laughs> so if you have octopi, octopi might no, sing no, above the line. Sounds like babies, uh, oh. it's octopuses. Okay. <laughs> they, they like people. They octopus like people. Well, it's very difficult to interpret the experiences which I've read about. Uh, as anything other than love. Yeah. Well, I think love of, of, of an octopus for a person and a person. Uh, yeah. But interestingly, they, you said about the brain being significant. Octopus, of course, has eight brains that cooperate in the network. So, um, it's, it's difficult. Well, I, I think at, at a bare minimum, even if we don't necessarily align on all these things, I think maybe we can perhaps align that we just don't know. And if we don't know, why not err on the side of caution? You know, if, if there's no biological requirement, then all of a sudden, you know, I think that it's, 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 it's only, even a question mark to me is a bit of an answer. Yeah, so. Well, I mean, and, yeah. Uh, right, uh, another question. I, mean, I, I was expecting you to be back on the ground. I mean, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. very busy, you know, a lot of publicity about the enormous resource that it takes to raise uh, animals for food, uh -huh. uh, as opposed to plants for food, uh, and the effect on the environment and uh, climate change. You haven't mentioned that. I mean, I had the one slide about climate change. I mean, to me, I, I think that's... I come at it, there, I think there's a, within the whole scope of veganism, there's a whole myriad of issues. Um, and you'll notice I also didn't say to do it because we'll be healthier. I think there are studies out there pointing in that direction. But to me, I consider that a bonus. And I think the, the environment, I think there is some compelling evidence as well. Um, that's why that um, uh, generally that the documentary Cowspiracy can cover it in much better depth than I think I can here tonight. Um, because I'm not a climate scientist, but I, I would say that the, the science definitely suggests that it is. Uh, I, I think, actually, I, the, the I think the, thru the current thrust in veganism, certainly I've got teenage children, uh, there's a huge thrust in veganism. Yeah. It is being driven by health and environmental issues mm -hmm. and not by animal rights, whereas traditionally it's been one of animal rights. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really interesting question. I think it comes back to almost like a, a behavior change, because I collaborate with a behavioral psychologist and. Um, one of the interesting things to me is I think the ethics of it, while they might be a, a, a more challenging conversation to have, I think to me it is the most compelling point, and there's been some new research coming out that it's the most motivating to inspire people to stay vegan. 
So while we might, and I think that's the danger with doing it as you know a diet, and I think you know uh, the game is an example where I think people do go on to veganism after that. However, if you do view it as a one month thing. And I know a lot of vegans who gain weight when they go vegan because they look like, oh, look at all this vegan cake that I can eat now, and you know, so it's not a guarantee. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I agree the environment's been more of a focus, though, recently. Uh, can well, can you explain what? to me why a fox has a right to eat a rabbit, but we don't have a right to eat a rabbit? Um, well, I guess just um, from a scientific perspective, I, are, are, I guess foxes would either be omnivore or no, no, foxes are almost, well, no, they are, they, are they carnivore like cats? Almost, uh, like they carnivores, I guess? Yes, they will eat apples and things, but they by and large eat, um, eat uh, other animals. Yeah, I mean, I guess necessity comes into it. I mean, I think if, uh, if we were all on a plane and we crashed and we were on this desolate place, no plant life, no animal life, you can make a moral case for cannibalism as an absolute necessity. The question is, we're not foxes and we're not rabbits. You know, no, we're not chasing rabbits. We're going into Sainsburys. So it's to me, it's, I think, I guess under under underpinning all that, I guess the question is, do we want to look to nature to dictate our moral decision making? And if we, you know, then the necessity, I think, is where it's a bit different. Does that? I mean, I guess are you? Are you uh, where else can you look apart from the nature to make your moral <coughs> your moral decision making? Well, I guess if we look at animals, I mean, within the animal kingdom, there's a lot of sexual assault that, uh, that occurs. You know, animals force themselves on other animals. We wouldn't say that that's a business case to be made for sexually assaulting other humans because they do it in nature. So if there's no biological requirement for us to, to use them, then, you know, where does that leave us? You know, I think, we're, you know, if, if we look at what lions do to the gazelle, I mean, I don't think anybody here would justify doing that to um, even animals. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about doing it in a kind way. I'm not I'm sure that you've answered my question. Is, which yes, is, which go is, ahead and ask it. Yeah, which is why a fox is allowed to kill a rabbit, but, but we aren't. Yeah, to me, vegan, veganism isn't about stopping nature. It's not about stopping free living beings from um, no, finding but stick, food. Stick, answer the question, please. <laughs> why, why is it alright for one, but not alright for the other? Because we're not foxes. No, it's but we are a species that um, is certainly um, evolved to eat animals and to kill animals. That's, but that's debatable, isn't it? You don't have the teeth or the guts to process meat. You can't, you can't kill a cow or a pig with your hands. You can't eviscerate an animal with your hands. You have to evolve to use tools and then evolve fire to then be able to digest have a problem it. To, to, to harvest a field of corn with your hands. But that, well, that's way later in our history. We were. We were eating fruits and nuts and seeds for millennia before we started um, growing crops. I think Are that you could suggesting be to me that, you do, that humans don't eat, <coughs> eat animals. <coughs> Historically, if you go back to nature, our gut is too long to process meat. We've got canine teeth. I would rather no, say the opposite of that. Our gut is too short to uh, process vegetables. Our biology is much more similar to an om a herbivore than it is a carnivore. Exactly. So if you look at our teeth, our teeth is more similar to a herbivore than it is to it's any omnivore or carnivore. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we, we generate uh, like enzymes in our, in our mouth that are um, made to pro uh, break down um, carbohydrates. Um, the way that our jaws, jaws move like side to side is more similar to a herbivore than it is to a carnivore. The, the way that I would answer your question David, is, uh, is to say that rights, animal rights, um, morality is purely human uh, invention. Mm. Uh, and, and so although there are pre-moral sentiments in animals which we eventually evolved through civilization uh, to create morals and moral ideas and the idea of animal rights and human rights. Animals don't possess that. You know, I think it's simply a function of our brains. No, 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 never will. Well, I think even, you know. even if we say we did evolve using animals, which I think, like you say, the, the, there's a, a bit of debate there, even if that was a part of our past, if there's no biological requirement today, you know, why continue to do that if we don't have to? You know, just because we can do something doesn't justify it. I, think, um, I was going to ask a, a question later, but I might as well ask it now. There's a, a, we had a talk from uh, Compassion and World Farming, which was, starts from the perspective of animal welfare. And you're starting from animal rights, which implies, of course, animal welfare. Uh, but uh, you can actually, you don't have to even consider animal rights if you just simply consider animal welfare. 
and, and you get to a certain point, and then there was the example of going, could you, if you can imagine an animal that was perfectly happy, and then it was alive one day, dead the next, happy life, and then you ate it. There's no moral argument against that whatsoever. Sorry, but uh, the animal welfare, that would be the ideal situation. I mean, because it's a fantasy, but uh, animal welfare is also more understandable, acceptable, and appreciated by probably virtually everybody. But animal rights, if you start from animal rights, that's a, it's, it's, a higher, it's a more difficult thing to comprehend, I think, than many people. So the, my question was going to be later, uh, does the vegan movement work in conjunction with something like Compassion and World Farm or animal rights, uh, animal um, welfare organizations? Yeah. Did you get on well with each other? Yeah, that's a really good, good question. And I think um, I represent the minority view um, within um, the vegan space most of the messaging you'll hear will appeal to that animal welfare and improving the way it's done, which to me, um, you know, if we were to flip it and look at other things, um, you know, if we were to look at um, uh, abusive situations within families, we wouldn't say to just, you know, uh, abuse your family member in a different way. We'd say to end it all together because it's not justified. I think you said that, you know, why rights if we have welfare? I would actually flip it around and say, why welfare if we have rights? You know, if we're, you know, if we don't have to use them, why not end their use? Because to me, welfare reforms <coughs> oftentimes, you know, I hate to say it, but they're quite meaningless. They oftentimes take five, ten plus years to kick in. There's some examples in the states recently of um, around chickens where the dates come up and they've extended it and no change has actually happened. And oftentimes the change will happen anyway because quite frankly it's more profitable. So it's one of those things that it's, I think, you know, as a, a vegetarian and pescatarian for 12 years, I've bought cage, I've, I've bought happy eggs. But the question is, you know, <coughs> is there a way to do it that's ethical? And you mentioned that if they had a, a good life and a quick end, you don't feel like there's any moral implications there? I no, guess. No, I don't know. Would you say the same if we're talking about dogs <coughs> for the Yulin Festival? Yes, because I don't think animals can appreciate the, the future. So if you'd say it's perfectly like. So I have two small terriers at home, they're both eight years old. They've lived a fantastic life, probably better than any animal who's been farmed. <laughs> if I were to go home and kill them for my dinner when it wasn't biologically necessary, do you think there'd be a moral justification for that? Well, I think it would upset you. And, uh, I, it upset, I guarantee one thing it would upset them more than it would me. Uh, I don't think so. It would upset uh, you and everybody around you. So it's not, that, that's a sort of socially unacceptable thing because because pets are a few different life. Uh, but from a moral perspective, I, I don't see the <clears throat> I think that touches on a, a, a point we touched on a bit earlier, is that human-centric versus animal-centric uh, framing. Because if we look at it, us um, using them, it's just one brief moment, and we don't look at them as a victim, it's, I think it's, it's, it, that's where that framework can start to take shape, where we can justify these things. But I, I think your approach is, is equally valid. It's a good, good approach as well, because yeah. the animal industry is all about distancing ourselves from animals, but at least the animals that we farm, not our pets. And I think your approach is, is, is directly head-on tackling that. You're hugging a cow, uh, and you say, oh, go and hug a cow, see what it's like. And you know, it would have that emotional effect, because we know that animals do feel pain and suffering. And suffering. I think there's some interesting questions around philosophy raised, but back to the relationship, I honestly don't know. I mean, maybe the welfare reforms will lead to a vegan world quicker, but at least from the studies I've read and the science that I've looked at from social movement change, I think um, it's the, um, the ending use that's the more compelling story that's going to lead to more, more compelling change. And the other interesting thing around this is if we listen to a message like this of talking about ending use, people who are going to reduce or look to buying more high welfare um, animal use um, things, they're going to do that anyway with that target of ending use. So we might as well send the ending use message as far as I'm concerned. But and you could also make the case for what you said earlier about, um, say if there's someone who um, mentally can't comprehend maybe their life to a certain extent, um, but would it be just socially unacceptable to kill them and eat them? Or would it be, um, <coughs> and or would it be like, would that be the only barrier to doing that? Would it be because it's not socially acceptable, or would it be because we think it's morally wrong? Well, it might be a talk later in the year, but uh, <laughs> because we've had talks on assisted dying, but uh, I think humans are going to be a different category. So. I'm not talking, yeah, about like in terms of like, uh, but why is it a different? Like, what is the moral 
differentiation between like uh, killing a, a, a cow because they we, we say we don't they they can't comprehend their death and they don't, they're not looking towards the future to some extent or something like that. Um, <clears throat> to doing that same thing to a, a human being who has say the same level of comprehension as they do. Like in the case of someone who's mentally disabled, yes. you just kill them quickly. Say, say if someone's got the yeah. mental maybe capacity of maybe say the, of the level of maybe similar to a pig or a cow or something like that. Would could could we make the same case for using them in the same way as we use animals? We're but not just paid to eat them. No, but no. That, but, um, but the question is, <laughs> like, you, you, you said that you said we're not. But we, you said we're not paying to eat dogs because it's socially unacceptable, no, not no. because it's. But it's it's a it's a moral argument. Yeah, but, uh, and it's one that is. It, it, it can be, and there's a certain scale. Uh, that, so when the House of Lords, the House of Commons at the moment, and the House of Lords are debating the idea of assisted dying, and at, at some point you say, at what level, at what, what people yeah. uh, should should be uh, euthanised, essentially. Yeah, but I'm not talking about euthanasia. We are just, talking about people. Not, yeah, yeah. I went around special needs schools in China in mm -hmm. 1996, and um, we were looking at uh, special education in China. And there were lots of kids with uh, issues and downs and things, but there were no, there were no seriously disabled children. And we said, "Where are they?" And the headmaster looked at us pointedly and said, "We don't have those in China. Mm. <laughs> you know, they are they are in the killing yeah. fields. They're in the killing. They're taken from the hillside. Dying groups. Yeah. 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 But like that. But that's and that's you could say the same thing. Like uh, if their their mental comprehension is that of the animals who do farm. Like, what is the justification we can use to kill the animals that, that we do farm if they've got a similar comprehension, say, for example, I think it's rather because, these I think humans? It's is it just because of the species? It's because it's, we're talking about people, and uh, because we're talking about people, it has social implications like society, human society. That's the difference. Yeah, so it's not, it's not a case of what attributes they have, it's just because no, I, it would be socially unacceptable. But, well, so what if it was socially acceptable? Would it be immoral to someone coming in Outside. I think social acceptability and morality are two different things. But mm -hmm. I mean, my brother used to work with um, what he used to call the babies, uh, not actually too far from me in, in Surrey. Uh, and so the baby wards were uh, uh, children were born that were extremely uh, uh, mentally deficient. And they would lie in cots, and that's it. They'd live to a certain point, they might live 10, 20, 30 years. Mm. Uh, they'd have no quality, zero quality of life, zero conscious, well, they were conscious. But they had um, no personality, no comprehension at all. Mm. So, and of course, that was going a humane way because you, didn't want, you don't want to euthanise or was against the laws to euthanise people. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a complicated argument. Oh, definitely. So yeah, it's a very it's a sensitive way. argument. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. But the, it's a construct. Well. Yeah, yes. But the thing sure. is, like the animals we're killing, they do have an understanding of life to a certain extent, don't they? Like the the chickens, the cows, and the, the Not pigs. Future. Pardon? They don't have a comprehension of the future. No, no, but like we're, we're, no, but then a lot of um, if we were thinking about like the comprehension of a human being in the same situation, because they because these pigs and cows they do understand to a certain extent what their life is, and they they and maybe not their, what their life is, but they they would try and protect their lives to, as much as they can. Like if you see the wildlife pro programs, they fight for their life and they fight for their children's lives as well. Often. Um, um, but the, the question is like morally, what is the difference between? treating like a, a human being of a certain comprehension of say that of a pig as an example and what is the difference between killing that person and killing a pig if the comprehension of their life is the same yeah like what is the difference well, I just answered that because we're talking about people it's, it's just it's just because it's species that's the only difference well, well, I think there's one, point, there's there's one important <laughs> point is that you 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 have to be sure about this person's reduced level of comprehension mm -hmm. yeah and uh, uh, it's very hard to be sure Hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and, and we're talking about a difference in species, we're also talking about a human animal who's not capable of, or seems questionable quality of life, to other animals who would have a quality of life. So I, I think to take it back a little bit more, just to, that awareness, because to me, and, and, and this to me, I think some people hear animal rights and might, you know, tense up a bit, but to me, I think this stuff's exciting, like figuring out what their level of awareness is, kind of put it back to your question, I mean, when you say they don't um, comprehend the future, do you think they can co comprehend that? They can comprehend the future because they hide their, they hide their food and they hide things. Anticipation. 
yeah. there, there are certain habits and uh, things they've learned. They, learn. they have evolved to avoid death, but I think that they can't comprehend death. I'm not sure. I think if um, uh, I know Gieson, who have worked for a while in slaughterhouse, uh, I'm sure he's got plenty of slaughterhouse stories. Mm. Um, but the cows going in sometimes smells death. Yeah. I'm panicked. Uh, and it's horrible. I mean, you, you know, it was um, why my friend became. They've um, evolved to realise that where there's a smell of lots of dead cows, it's a bad place to be. Because yeah. yeah, some animals are prey animals, and yeah. therefore they, I think yeah. prey animals will have an awareness of death because they've got to avoid death. Okay, so that's not the future. It's <laughs> well, let me just throw this out there. I, mean, I think, I think there's, a, there's, there's one thing I long to ask you guys a famous thought experiment. Well, um, sorry, if I, if I can just jump in, just to stay on the, the point just for a moment. The story that came to mind is I just read an article yesterday that came out about a year ago where a free-living horse was hit by a car and their body was lying by the side of the road. And the group of um, horses that were with them stayed and mourned for days. If you look at the separation between, you know, you know if you look at the separation between um, uh, dairy cows, mothers from their sons and daughters, they try for days. People will be called out to the farm because they think a murder is happening and it's a cow crawling out for their young. This is not an and awareness of death. This is, an, this is a, a feeling that they want their young, or in the case of the horses, that they want the, the other horse. It's got nothing to do with an, a, a, an ability to foretell death. So do you think animals would mourn if they didn't have any awareness? I mean, if they were just, oh, my buddy's not moving anymore, it's sweet, let's carry on. Or actually, the where'd they go? Are, are noticing that that one of their group is missing, uh -huh. um, but I don't think that they have a concept of, of, of death, no. And, and, and back to the earlier example, neither do some mentally disabled human animals. Fine, fine, fine but that's, not an, that's, that's, that's a, a separate issue. Um, at, a, at a basic level, is it? I mean, because I'm not campaigning for like rights, the same rights for humans and animals. I'm just campaign, campaigning for basic rights. Do you know chickens do that as well? When a chicken dies in a group, um, well, I always see the, the chicken die out for the others to see. And well, if 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 she's dying, um, yeah. um, they will or one per, one person, one chicken will always stay with her, or you know they'll always uh, stay nearby, or, or close to them, but some will stay very close by. And they they literally uh, stay with this dying chicken, and when it's dead, they will stay with it for a while, and they will look at it, and then they, you know, have a look, and then go away again, and they all just look around nearby but for, for, for some hours, and then they will gradually move away. So they seem to mourn, uh, you know, one of their number, and they've, you know, they've just come together by accident. They're ex battery guns, you know, and so they just. You know, I think within the area of philosophy, I think most of us will agree, a lot of these are tricky questions, and I'm not saying just because we've observed this <laughs> that they mourn and they're aware of death, but it just helps build the questions. I mean, I'm just not sure at the very basic level, so, you know, why do it? I mean, you said you had another question that... Well, yes, yeah, so there's oh, a... Uh, <laughs> Um, you, you next then, yeah. There's a famous thought experiment, which um, I don't know if you've addressed this, but uh, the, the idea is, is that uh, we can breed all sorts of characteristics into animals. Um, uh, and uh, we could, of course, breed a pig that wants to be killed for meat. Could we? Yes, of course we could. Haven't we tried? And I don't know if you've watched Slaughterhouse footage, but those those pigs aren't going on to kill for by themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's a thought experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. So it's, it's a hypothetical. Yeah, 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 it's a hypothetical. Yeah, gotcha. But uh, if, I was, if I were to be successful and breed a pig that wanted to be killed for food, um, would you eat it? <laughs> <laughs> Just because the idea of eating someone's body when I don't have to, um, I would There's say the same. Some what, 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 Germans who ate each other, aren't they? <laughs> well, I mean, what, what about someone who's mentally disabled? I think there's probably generally, I mean, that's a, a small set, but there's probably humans out there that would say, you know what, I don't care about my life, please eat me. I still, you know, even if they committed suicide, no, no, this I wouldn't say. Some sort of dysfunction. This is 
uh, the paper that's being bred with this characteristic. Yeah, it wants me, and you're going to be very unkind. Well, I, I, I think to me, I think the the limits with thought experience is, is is the question. You know, can unexceptional examples apply to non-exceptional ones? So, you know, I don't. I'm not sure how that factors into our day-to-day -day animal use. Well, it, it it's significant because it um it sort of picks out uh, this moral. Is moral correct. There are all sorts of reasons for being vegan, and, um, you know, yeah. that. but uh, I do worry slightly about using the anthropomorphizing argument, uh, partly because of the limits, you know, which we discussed, but also because I think um, it, 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 could, it can fall down uh, simply because you, you're making yourself. You yeah, I mean, I guess to me, we talk a lot about anthropomorphizing and uh, the animal rights space, and to me, that would be putting um, animals into dresses and dressing them up like people. I think if we observe an animal ex like being happy or being sad, to me, that's not a human trait that we're putting onto them. That's them having those experiences. So I think you're right; it does help to relate. But I, I think I think you hit a really good point. Like they don't necessarily have moral value because they're like us. They have moral value in and of themselves. And I think through, through like you say, comparing them to human animals' experiences helps to, to help us understand it better. Yeah. Did you want to? Um, can, can, can we just have a short please? Yeah. Yeah. Can we please have that man's question? All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm too uh, yeah. incredibly unassertive, that's what I'm talking about. I've got some equipment for God like this. Oh, no! Celebrate first and then get back to it. The question I, I, I would like to ask is a kind of them and us problem uh, okay. with regard to uh, if you think of mosquitoes, if you think of locusts, there's a very much a them and us. Mm -hmm. Are they good as the ones that survive, or do we survive? In which case, we, we seek to kill them. Uh, is it a matter of how we kill them that becomes the sort of moral problem? Uh, or should we kill them at all? Uh, because it does seem that we're, it's interesting that medics call them antibiotics rather than probiotics. Yeah. They're meant to kill things. <laughs> Uh, so where up the phylogenetic tree does it kick in that you know going to become vegan and sort of I can understand with fluffy animals you know this sort of anthropomorphism kicks in and it doesn't want to see a, a charming koala bear kill. but watch anyone with a mozzie <laughs> dead. Well, it sounds like kind of two main things here. I'll do this quick cause, just in case anybody's flatters or talking to them. Um, <laughs> and then we can come back to it. But I guess, I, I guess to me, there's two different things. There's um, from a self-defense perspective, um, and then also, you know, are we actually threatened by these animals if we didn't use them? From a self-defense perspective, you know, if uh, we were being attacked by animals, I would help defend the group to the extent like, that were attacking us. And I think mosquitoes is an interesting example. I'd say as far as whether or not they're going to attack us or be a threat to us, specifically for cows, pigs, chickens, and so on, I'd say if we're worried about that, we probably just shouldn't breed them in the first place if they're a threat to us. You know? but I agree, it's an interesting question where we draw that line in between self-defense, but I do think this goes outside of the focus of veganism um, about and, and more in the broader scope. Sorry? You talk about wild animals. Around here, the farmers have to, have to control rabbits and pigeons, and especially deer. I mean, they have to shoot the deer and things like that. Otherwise, you'd never grow your ve your um, vegetarian stuff, you know. Well, I mean, I guess the, uh, the regulated killing that goes on around animal use is an interesting one because um, it also talks about the crops. But if that's concern, we still use far more crops to filter through other animals and eating the crops directly. So, if we're concerned about keeping that protected, why not have a much smaller space to do it with? And I, but I agree, it's a, it's a tricky conversation for me. I think. Um, veganism isn't necessarily um, the end, it's the beginning, and helps us to explore some of these topics further. Mm -hmm. Does that help to...? Yeah I, yeah, I just don't know what you're going to do about the animals do need controlling, that's all. Well, the trouble, the trouble about animals need controlling is that, you know, it's like that, that joke, you know, a, a man who stops a farmer and says, I'm completely lost, how do I get to so-and-so? And the farmer says, well, I wouldn't start from here. The thing is, we wouldn't actually start from here. The trouble with deer 
is that deer have spread in open spaces. We shouldn't have open spaces. The, the downs are not designed as open spaces, they're designed as woods. Dartmoor is a wood. The new forest is a wood. For, the word forest means <coughs> clearing, yeah. actually. So um, it, we, there's a lot of talk about the environmental movement about rewilding, and in Scotland, they are, they've just shot, t I think it's 10,000 red deer, yeah. so that the trees can start to rewild uh, <coughs> moors, because the moors are not supposed to be blooming moors, they're supposed to be forested. So if you rewild the moors, that then keeps down the wild deer population, because the wild deer have no food to eat, and therefore they have a much smaller population. Then you, thought, then you go right back to then, so where are we going to get our food from? I suggest the co-op. <laughs> and don't forget, meat is murder, but fish is justifiable homicide. <laughs> That's generally joke. Shall we have a little yeah, break? Yeah, definitely, because we haven't gone over there. A few more questions after this. So, so, there are lots more. Yeah, yeah sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> so there you have it. There's the Q&A. Now, I've been vegan for about six years. In fact, my vegan anniversary is on the 24th of February, so it may have already happened by the time this video comes out. Vegan for six years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vegan for six years, this is only the start. Now, in the last three years since I started campaigning for animal rights on a more full-time basis, I've never done anything like this, but it was so much fun, and I heard so many questions I've never heard before. This to me just shows that when we follow our passion, we never know where it might take us. And I can't wait to explore this area of my advocacy further, and I actually have a talk booked in at a Skeptics in the Pub group uh, for next month. Now one really cool part about this is I actually got feedback from the group shortly after I did the talk. And I think as animal advocates, we can often say things, but we're not necessarily sure how they're interpreted. And this was a rare glimpse at what another person was thinking as they were listening to my message. The really cool thing about this is they seem to take on board the difference between welfare and animal rights, which is, I think is a really key distinction for us all to make. This was such a great experience, and if you enjoyed watching this, you might like to look into your local area for skeptics in the pub or humanists or other similar groups who might be interested in having in a speaker to discuss veganism and animal rights. Now, if you enjoyed this more long-form discussion, please let me know in the comments because I'm always evaluating where I dedicate my time, and if I know people are enjoying watching these things, I'll keep doing them. Another cool element to this event that I wasn't expecting is it actually got local coverage in the newspaper. Now, while I've done uh, some mainstream media appearances, especially on the radio in the past, I've never had one of my specific events covered in the newspaper before, so this is pretty exciting. Now, this was just the first half of the Q&A. In the second half, we continue to explore all kinds of complex topics, including horses who are used to be ridden and dogs who are used for guides um, for those with disabilities. Do you want to miss out on the rest of the Q&A? I didn't think so. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. See you in the next video. The dog has a brain and a central nervous system. The plant does not. If I had both here... <laughs> I was not brought here for my dancing, so that's not going to be anything. <laughs> I hope they have those big sombreros. That's two. That, that makes no sense. <laughs> I've done a few talks and that's the first time that I've had that experience. <laughs> Another memory. Thanks for watching and for free support for new vegans and free resources such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com.